is time for another club webinar number 51. Club webinars are where we take your questions, we do the research, and we answer them. A little more casual than what we do with our Q&A public webinar uh, once a month. It's always the last, uh, second to the last Thursday of every month. And uh, we take six topics and break them down for you. And the club webinar, a little more personal, uh, questions that came in that can be either answered quickly or uh, I can show you how to research. Kind of a more one-on-one -on -one atmosphere. If you want more information about the different webinars that we have and what's in the club, you can go to cco.us forward slash club. Um, know that today we're going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. We're going to understand the coding surrounding COVID-19 because that's what everybody's talking about and we're getting bombarded with excellent questions. So I went and grabbed like seven questions that I knew would be easy for me to explain to you. Um, how to look up the answers or uh, some practical uh, thought processes is behind how to code for that. Now, as always, you guys know, I do the disease process, the ICD-10, uh, the, the risk adjustment aspect. That's my forte. Jennifer's been coming to you also and given some billing highlights with Medicare and telehealth and stuff. Um, and she'll be back with us third first day to do that. Uh, if you need CEUs, guys, if you need some uh, support with questions that you have in your everyday coding life, then the club's for you. Come to cco.us forward slash club. We have uh, extended product support in there. Our club members, we get to know them and we always jump right away to answer their questions. In the meantime, it's a place where you can get a lot of very applicable CEU. So if you like getting training from us, the CCO club is where you go. We also get in there and we chat and discuss all types of things not just coding and billing, but we talk about compliance, we talk about, uh, uh, let's see, auditing, and we also have a pharmacology course and a pathophysiology course, which might be a great time now if you're home to pick up some of that extra knowledge to make you a faster coder and more accurate. So let's get down to the first question that was given. And again, these questions all came from, I believe, the Q&A webinar, the public webinar that we did, um, I believe that was last Thursday or the Thursday before. Um, that recording is all in the club and you can go back and uh, check that out. We did talk about COVID-19, the coronavirus and other information, but this, these are questions that came in that we didn't get uh, a chance to answer at the end or we um, or that came in afterwards and they came into our topic request area. So let's start with the first one. I thought this was a really brilliant question. Paige Black had asked this. It said, uh, with this being really bad allergy season as well, how can we tell the difference between allergies and the coronavirus? Well, Great question. Uh, we know the three main signs and symptoms for the coronavirus is fever. We, we know it's fever. We know it's a dry cough. And we know that it is uh, shortness of breath, right? Well, again, aller we're getting right into that allergy season. Uh, spring has sprung for us in Texas. The blue bonnets have popped out. I got a bunch of them in my backyard. Luckily, they don't have allergens with them. I don't know anybody that's allergic to blue bonnets. They do have a thing down here in Texas called cedar fever though, but that's more towards Christmas. And uh, maybe you have hay fever. Maybe you have some of the other uh, biggies that happen in the spring. Yeah, it's miserable. I went to school with a guy, his whole face used to swell up. Eyes would swell shut, really severely allergic uh, to, I believe it was hay fever. And uh, those don't sound like signs and symptoms 
that I gave you the three main ones for coronavirus uh, with our COVID-19, but there are other coronaviruses. Keep that in mind too. SARS, MERS, um, the all you know, all of those are types of coronaviruses. But I know that Paige was specifically asking about COVID-19 because that's what we were talking about. And uh, so how, how are we going to tell the signs and symptoms? Now, if you're asking from a clinical standpoint and from the physician, you know, I, I'm not a doctor. And I'm not sure, but I may have lost connection there for a little bit. Boy, it'll have to tell me if I did. It popped up in my other eye here. Uh, okay, how long does it last? Usually when you have an allergy or allergic reaction and stuff, it, it doesn't hang on. Okay, so uh, 
is it typical time for you to have those reactions and how long does it last? Another thing is dry cough. This is a something that is stated in that they have a dry cough and shortness of breath. Now, as a person who has asthma, if I'm going to have an allergic, uh, something triggers my allergies, it's going to affect my breathing and I will cough. Uh, but I don't usually get a dry cough. When you have asthma, your body tries to save itself, and so it starts producing mucus. And so I, I have a productive cough, not a dry cough. And most allergies, I, I'm not an expert in allergies, but uh, from my reading experience with the medical records and stuff, allergies don't typically uh, exacerbate themselves with a dry cough. They can do shortness of breath. But shortness of breath and a dry cough, a little bit different. Uh, what are the allergens? You know, if it's uh, pollen and mold, you check the counts, right? And um, and so the provider uh, may say, you know, what are your typical allergens? And you say, oh, I have a really uh, big problem with mold. Uh, okay. Uh, so if you hadn't been to an allergist before, you've been to an allergist, they may reference those records and note, you know, uh, mold count is excessively high um, this past week. And uh, so that would help them determine, hmm, you know, that that might be a, the sign and symptom of an allergy. Uh, also, does it get worse or get better? Okay, so if you, uh, and, and I think six and seven kind of are attributes, uh, with each other allergies run their course right and they don't usually get worse now i already gave you the example of what usually happens to me if i don't take some good allergy medicine or i don't take advantage of my inhalers that i have uh, to to assist me or avoid the the pollens outside or whatever i'm allergic to so yes it can get worse but typically it doesn't progress into other things. I know the signs and symptoms for me and most people that suffer routine yearly allergies when they're when the provider questions them then they can articulate now this seems to be what's happening uh, has happened to me for the last couple of years about the same time of the year but now with all this COVID stuff going on I'm nervous is it my allergies or is it something else and big key factor the provider is going to say did you get relief from your allergy medication Oh, you know, oh, yes, it, it did help. Yes, my inhaler helped. Uh, it, it, you know, um, uh, yeah, I took my water, the allergy medicines now. Uh, the allergy medicines that you normally take, um, Claritin is what I used to, to take. So um, depending on what type of allergies that you have, yeah, that would help. Now, if you're not getting relief, from allergy medication, you're getting worse, you're starting to run a fever, your cough is dry, and then you're starting to get other chest pains and stuff. Yeah, then then the doctor is going to say, you know, and, and have you been exposed? You know, that's how you're going to look at that is, are these signs and symptoms of allergy season? Or are these signs and symptoms of this new coronavirus called COVID-19? Right. And you'll be able to see as uh, the documentation, as it progresses, as you're, you know, maybe we're not all seeing all of the, the COVID documentation come through yet, but give it another week and then those uh, charts will start hitting your desk if they haven't already. And you'll get a feel for the questions to rule out COVID or the screening to, to rule out COVID versus some other signs and symptoms. All right. Thanks, Paige. That was a really good question. And and when that popped up, I thought that's that's good, especially for some of the people that are newer coders that don't quite have the disease processes under their belt, maybe the, the background. Uh, and signs and symptoms are always something that new coders tend to struggle with trying to navigate you know it's a you know when you're doing testing purposes they're they're going to to test you to see if you know the signs and symptoms for the disease process and out in the real world is actually a lot easier <laughs> to do that because the providers do kind of separate that or they they say you know to rule out xyz yeah. 
good question. I'm going to look over here just a second. I think, yeah, my sound went out for a while, but it came back. Uh, let's see. Whitney says, I've seen so many patients already that I can't keep up. Uh, the county where I live is the worst in the state, right? You know, uh, you've got to be uh, getting a feel for the verbiage that's coming through and the documentation. You know, and, and let's not forget that um, how many of us have lived through something really, really new that's come through? Like now, I remember SARS. I remember MERS, you know, um, it, you know the H1N1, all those different flus. I remember them. I, I'm not old enough to remember polio, but my um, parents and my grandparents and my parents are just right on the edge of the polio thing. Um, uh, however, that is something that, the, you know, the documentation that would have come in through that and getting a feel for for it um, hitting everybody. And uh, tuberculosis is out there, but we don't see too much of a resurgence. So now, remember, we can have an epidemic of stuff, but the pandemic, meaning it's went all over um, the world. Epidemic's kind of uh, locational. Another question that came in that was really, really good, and I and this also was directly related to the webinar that we did, uh, where uh, my portion was that I was saying different types of uh, COVID and related. Uh, diagnosis. So you get COVID and then you get pneumonia. You get uh, upper respiratory infection uh, due to COVID. So this is a pneumonia due to COVID, mm, uh, uh, ARDS due to COVID, things like that. And so uh, Abigail Brooks wanted clarification. Uh, as you may already know, U07.1 is the new COVID diagnosis code and it comes uh, as official the the tomorrow I guess April 1st now before that you would use B97.29 other coronavirus as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere you don't use unspecified because if they're diagnosed with COVID-19 it's specified so you would use an other diagnosis meaning there isn't a code for it. So they fast tracked, which is huge, it's never been done before, uh, a, a code. And one of the reasons they did that, and they didn't do it for SARS and MERS and some of those other coronaviruses, uh, because they were epidemics, they weren't pandemics. But a pandemic is something that statistically we have to capture. Uh, it's very important as far as uh, who is concerned, the World Health Organization and the CDC and uh, other organizations like CMS, they need to be able to track this. That's what, that's why we code. And so a, a code was created. And as you know, we don't know of any other U codes, right? The first pandemic code that, that we've had. However, it is a code for a virus, a corona virus, the SARS-CoV-2, not CoV, the first one. This is a second SARS uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2, and its name is COVID-19. That is the name of the virus. Uh, so U07.1, as of tomorrow, will be the code that we will be using, and we'll get a full description of it. Uh, uh, and we'll get some guidelines implemented. However, the sequencing is very confusing. So uh, she had asked, will ultimately, will we be coding the B97.29 with the UO7.1? I don't think so, okay? Because UO7.1 will replace B97.29. Uh, B97.29 is the other, meaning we don't have a code for it yet, and we will have a code U07.1. Now, we also have a lot of people that have been asking, well, how do we sequence the U07.1? The, the best way 
to think about that is we're going to drop the B97.29 and we're replacing the U07.1 with that. And that means you treat it just like the sequencing you would use for B97.29. And so some of you think, well, yeah, but I don't, that's not a code I usually have. Well, when you look at the description, you're going to follow the steps, you know, uh, like that. And then think of other types of viruses. The one I gave is an example at the, that particular presentation. I said, use the example of HIV. HIV is a virus, right? And so how do you code HIV? If the patient is being seen for HIV, then you code the HIV first, right? If the patient person is being seen and treated for COVID-19, okay, that can be listed. However, if the person has pneumonia, J18.89, uh, no, they don't, you're going to code for the pneumonia. Why do they have the pneumonia? Because of the COVID-19 virus. Okay, so think of the sequencing just like you do any other virus. Just because this is a new code, just because this is a U code that we've never, you know, seen, or you say, well, it's a pandemic code. Well, that's not really, as far as we know, you know, tomorrow we'll probably know more because they'll stipulate a guideline when they actually give us the information. But treat it like you do every other virus code. Don't get upset and worried. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a grace period here. I urge you to do what most compliances, compliance departments will do. Uh, and if you are in the role of needing to, to be the uh, person that shares the information with the rest of the office, uh, it, saying, you know, how what, what is our policy? That's just it. You need to set up a policy. Stick with that policy. So your office says, this is how we're going to code the new COVID-19 U07.1 because this is the way we understand it at this point with the direction we're giving. Give everybody the information. You have a talk about it. You give some examples. Everybody says, I understand. You sign off on it. And that's what you use going forward. And then in a month or so, it, or, or when you go back and get audited and they say, oh, you guys coded this all wrong. You don't have to worry about it then because you you will get a correction, but that ding is not going to be such a heavy ding because you were uh, not trying to do defraud or abuse. You came up with a standard and a policy. You implement, you trained on it and you implemented it and you were consistent. That's where people get in trouble. You know, yes, we make mistakes and we don't have a lot of clarity right now. There is a little bit of gray area. However, as things become more clear, as the information's rolled out, unlike we've ever had before, a brand new code, which is really quite exciting if you think about it. Again, you're going to come up with a policy and procedure on what to do going forward. Everybody's gonna train. You're going to sign off on it and implement it and write it down. You know, have a meeting, have minutes, file that. You know, even if you don't have a big compliance office program, there should be somebody in your office that is your compliance person. Right. Uh, you can get the provider involved to let them offer their opinions. Um, and say, this is the reason, you know, I want to do it this way. Do you have any insight? Is there anything you would like to add or contribute? Uh, and we know the signs and symptoms, the three. So we aren't going to code the signs and symptoms uh, when you have the code U07.1. We wouldn't code the signs and symptoms anyway because we have B97.29. And don't use the unspecified B97 code because if they're diagnosed with COVID-19, it is specified. All right, as of tomorrow, you get to use the new code, U07.1. Another question came in, and it was just kind of easier to, um, Colette asked this several times, uh, and uh, when I was doing 
when we were doing the webinar, it was it's kind of hard to have that time to talk in between. Um, and we're typing out messages in the big monthly Q&A webinar. And so I felt like we weren't on the same page. She was asking the questions and she would rechange the way she asked the questions to help me understand or whoever was answering. It's like, I don't think you got that right. And um, so she had said, finally, she goes, I don't understand the difference between acute um, uh, LRI, which is lower respiratory infection or not otherwise specified and associated LRI, not otherwise specified with COVID. OK, and uh, the acute LRI doesn't list COVID-19. So why is it included? OK, so um, to clarify, and I thought it might just be easier to, to talk through it. There wasn't really any uh, graphics or that we could we could look at. However, I do have uh, I can pull over the um, my the encoder, but I always lo already lost connection once, I think. So we're going to be careful and hope that I don't. Uh, lose another one with the internet. We have storms coming in through, so uh, that always messes with our internet. Plus, this is high bandwidth time, right, with everybody being home. So, Colette, excellent question, and what we were doing in that little presentation was showing you how to code pneumonia, lower respiratory infection, uh, ARDS, uh, other types of diseases or, uh, that that CMS had stated that, hey, this is this is guidance on how to code that, uh, what codes to use, and that B97 code that I was just telling you about. So honestly, an acute lower respiratory infection, if COVID is uh, 19 is with that, you could still code acute lower respiratory infection, uh, but with its associated lower respiratory infection and COVID-19, uh, it, it ultimately ends up being the same codes. Yeah, so um, lower respiratory infection, we know that COVID-19 affects the lungs. So those common things that would ex uh, become exacerbated, chances are, and this is my humble opinion, the don't, say 100%, but you're probably not going to have just a lower respiratory infection. Lower respiratory infection ends up being pneumonia when you break it down because upper respiratory infection, then you get like rhinitis and then it goes in and like we're, we're thinking the upper part of the respiratory system. When you say lower, that's the lower lungs and um, that tends to be pneumonia. And when you go look at the codes, that tends to be pneumonia. So I'm not sure if um, that's helpful or not, but just know that the records that I'm reading is we're, we may have an acute lower respiratory infection. If that person does and they have COVID-19, they're being placed inpatient and then you're going to have a solid diagnosis at a higher specificity than an LRI with COVID-19 you know, um, that person is not going to go home. That being said, it'll change the coding. It'll be inpatient, not outpatient. And um, the, um, you know, it'll be coded differently from that point forward. Now, can a person go home with a low, you know, just because you have COVID-19 does not mean that you have to go to the hospital. Uh, you can it can run its course and you can get through it uh, before when it first started coming out and it was as we were learning the uh, we were saying you know as you always say with the flu because it's the, the type of flu a viral flu we we would say the elderly and the young though and and uh, lowered immune systems those are the people that are, are going to be hit the hardest well now we know Mm, that's not always that these young, healthy people um, in their 30s and their 40s are succumbing and they don't have any comorbidities. Uh, other things, they get pneumonia and then they get ARDS and, and they just and and it's not because they don't have the equipment either. So um, it's the fact that it's a virus and 
you have to treat the signs and symptoms of a virus. You can't give them an antibiotic. And that's why everybody's so excited about this antiviral medication that's used for malaria, because it brings down the signs and symptoms of malaria, which is high fever and uh, doesn't necessarily go to the lungs. But uh, malaria is something that you always have in your system once you get you get it and it has these flares and it makes you very very sick um, and then you can get other things uh, as your body's compromised and that's kind of the way COVID-19 is exhibiting itself in my personal reading and everything that's why they're very excited about this antiviral medication however it's not a cure it just means that it's working on the signs and symptoms and uh, giving some people some relief and a little more strength to fight the COVID-19 virus. Uh, okay, so I hope I answered that. Let me just look over here. Uh, let's see. This will be for the data service of 4.1 or later, correct? Anything before that data service, even if they code it tomorrow, would be code. Uh, okay, they're going to clarify that tomorrow. Uh, I am sure. Uh, I have read two things. You know, it's will be implemented um, April first, but they they don't implement a code. Once it's implemented in the code set, it's retractable. It'll go back to October first. There, there's there's it's put in. The fact that it's put in in the middle of the year it's never happened before. But um, no, they're going to retrograde it. However. <laughs> The, the issue is nobody's systems are set up to accept the COVID code because it didn't exist. So my IT is limited knowledge, but think about this, the scrubbers, the everything that works in, when you go in and you plug in that new code, they it's like they can put in to the system and say, hey, this is the new code, it's implemented, um, April 1st, but you can't tell the computers yet to go back and retrograde that. Okay. Uh, so again, it's, I think it's just an IT issue. They'll give us more guidance as far as what we need to do. Now, if you have a patient that's an inpatient and we have the U code, then they'll just switch that code over and it'll, it, you know, it, it'll go back. But I think it's kind of, it's not semantics. I don't know what, what would that word be where it's the, the, not the linguistics, the logistics of implementing a code like we've never, ever done before. It, not at the beginning of the code set. Uh, so we'll, we'll get as of right now or April 1st until they tell us that all the systems will get that plug in that will allow them to adapt. You're going to have to use the B code for anything before April 1st. Okay, even though it's it will be a valid code as of October 1st in the past. Sign language for in the past. Okay, uh, would you all might have time to answer a question that is related to examining COVID-19 patients? Probably. What if the hospitalist does a visual exam through a window? Do they do you bill for this? That is, um, if it's not telehealth, the pay, the the um, <laughs> I, I haven't heard anybody ask this before. That's pretty cool. Uh, but there's a lot of nuances with telehealth. So this isn't considered telehealth. But when you do uh, the evaluation and the management of a patient, part of that is the hands-on experience, right? Uh, and if you're not able to physically touch the patient, then you can't use those codes, right? You can't add that to the ENM. Now, can they still observe and treat that patient? Absolutely, they can. Don't use a telehealth code because that's not what this is. Um, are there going to be uh, extremes and, and stuff, the evaluation and management of a patient that they are not actually touching? Yeah, they, they've, they've done that before. So. Um, yeah, I, I think a hospitalist could do a visual exam through a window. Mm, yeah, it, uh, yeah, she, yeah. Winnie says the hospitalist is standing outside the room looking in. So, uh, 
you know, yeah, and you're hooked up to monitors and, and so on and so forth. Just you can't document something that you can't do. So in the documentation, you can't state that the patient's skin is uh, warm and clammy because you can't touch it. And technically, you probably wouldn't be able to absorb it, you know, per se. So uh, but can you talk to the patient? Yes. Can you um, see the vital signs that are on the machines because they're hooked up? Yes. So Whitney, what I would say is the compliance department is going to make a policy for that. And then they will go forward, just like we talked about earlier. You know, and, and, and you know, luckily, we don't have to make those decisions. The compliance department and everybody else um, uh, gets to do that. And again, yes, they're doing that. Um, they're trying this to limit exposure. And yeah, so they, you know, they are they are doing the work. It's just make sure it's not a copy and paste in the documentation. You can't give them points for something just like telehealth. You know they can't do. So when they say they, you know, looked at the vital signs, it did this and that from the machines, the telemonitoring machines. And telemonitoring is not the same as telehealth. So it's meaning that it comes up on a machine and stuff. Okay. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to oscillate the lungs unless that patient had a nurse in there and oscillated it. But the provider has to be able to be the one to do that. Another question that came in, study from American Journal of Gastroenterology published uh, shows GI symptoms are possible now with COVID-19. Uh, Colette had sent this in. This is the website that she gave. I tried that link. I copied and pasted it, and it didn't work for me. So I went to eurekaalert.org. I uh, went through and tried to find the article. I couldn't find the exact article because, man, those people pump out articles every day, a lot in a day. Uh, I'm not familiar with this website, but it uh, appeared to be a website that was reputable. And um, uh, again, so I, I can't vet that, but I know that um, it, it looked to be a very reputable website. Since I couldn't find the exact information that Colette mentioned, and I'm assuming that she read it, uh, I went ahead and pulled the CDC uh, had one. And of course, we know what the information is that they're pumping out. That is the link that the CDC gave for signs and symptoms. Uh, now, I'm going to show you that real quick because I've got it on the other screen, but it's not anything anything new. COVID-19 is new. That's one of the reasons, besides, that's one of the reasons it became a pandemic. It got out of hand and spread globally. Um, it, it's, it, it, and we don't know that it's morphing and not morphing. Now, uh, my husband was just telling me about reading an article and I don't know where he got the article. Uh, so I can't say that it's vetted, but this is one of the things I know that they're discussing and they're worried about it is that they have COVID-19 patients who recovered, tested negative, and then after a specific amount of time went back and tested them again, and they were positive, and they didn't have signs or symptoms. So they, does that mean they're carriers, asymptomatic carriers? That means that they can give it to everybody else. You know, again, this is all them studying. And I know you have to be very, very careful uh, to what you are reading. Always make sure that it's a reputable source. So uh, the CDC.gov, reputable source. The World Health Organization, who? Reputable source. CMS.gov, reputable source. Uh, the the uh, you know then you're going to start going to other sources that you know now some of those sources are a little hard to navigate but this particular uh, link just gave a pdf and i'm sure it was like a psa you know but here is what it looks like so i couldn't i wanted to like copy it and take it i know you can get it in uh in pdf form but 
the signs and symptoms, the official signs and symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And they say the symptoms may appear two to 14 days after exposure, which is novel. Interesting. Uh, then they were, you know, they go on to tell you seek medical advice. That doesn't mean you have to go to the doctor. You call now. Telehealth is they're wanting to limit exposure. Um, if you develop the symptoms and have been in close contact with a person known to have COVID-19, or if you live in a, uh, if you have recently been in an area ongoing spread of COVID-19. Now that. You know where the hot spots are, and they are where there's a, a international. Uh, a nice way of thinking about it is an international airport. They got uh, that's the hubs. That's where people are mingled in the spread. You know, um, that's why we know New York, and it's spreading from New York, and that's why we know Seattle. Boom, they got it, and different places of California. Boom, um, Dallas, Fort Worth. Boom, Atlanta, Georgia. Boom, these are all international airports and in, in Florida right so again knowing that this is what you go by and and again this is why you would these are the questions that are going to ask back for the allergy one right so uh, this is the official word from the CDC and you just go to cdc.gov forward slash COVID-19 hyphen symptoms now also in addition to that, I went ahead and used our nifty little um, search technique that uh, uh, Laureen teaches us is that you can, if there's a specific website that you want to look at, so cms.gov, you can put in cms.gov and then, you know, do like the, the uh, colon site colon COVID-19 and it will give you a cert the search engine with only links to CMS.gov. So I did that and I picked this which would be ideal for you to launch off of the partner tool and notice this says CMS.gov outreach um, education hyphen education. Okay now I don't know how well you can see this, but the CDC homepage. So again, they're referencing each other. Coronavirus.gov. Anything you see on there, you know, would be a reputable source. USA.gov, which they're going to cite the CDC and and uh, who. Uh, the USA.gov uh, has a Spanish link as well. Um, then the White House came out with Families First uh, Response Act, the Workplace, School and Home Guidance, and a framework uh, for migration. Is that migration? I can't. Mit mitigation. Mitigation, not migration. Sorry. I have to get my glasses on to see that print. Uh, so then for uh, general public, washing your hands video, stop the spread of germ, the informatics. OK, and this is where I got the CD, uh, the COVID-19 signs and symptoms, faith based communities, how we're going to reach out, you know, because people still want to gather uh, high risk groups, CDC guidance. So you can go and look, you know, in my high risk group. Well, I have asthma, so I'm avoiding everybody. Uh, I have a son with rheumatoid arthritis. He is autoimmune. That would put you at a higher risk uh, then. We can just keep going. Rural community communities, uh, Medicare beneficiaries. What you need to know: telemedicine. Okay, the expanded services, waivers and stuff. And I'm not going to get into that because Jennifer has done already a couple webinars on that question. Still come in another. I think 90 diagnoses has got dropped uh, today for telehealth use, uh, meaning dropped for use uh, they can use uh, and another thing I'd like to mention too uh, that is is really interesting <laughs> the analogy that I gave was you know telehealth has been there for a long time and a lot a lot of people took advantages of it and a lot of providers weren't involved with it because it was available, but there really wasn't a need. Now there's a need, and now that we're using it and it's working so well, 
it's kind of like giving someone a, someone a credit card. When this is over, you're not going to take that credit card away from them. Telehealth is here to stay. So I urge you to learn as much in your downtime on telehealth as you can. Pre-COVID-19, what the rules and guidelines were, to the expanded telehealth services. Because just because they're allowing it now does not mean they will allow it in three months. Telehealth is going is, is here to stay now. Uh, but again, mm, it's going to change. So if you need to in, increase your knowledge base, that's where it would be a good place to do. Uh, let's see, caregivers, guidelines, marketplace consumers, and then it just goes on and on. If you're a clinician, then it goes in. HHS, which is Health and Human Services, will uh, has also given information about the COVID. So go to cms.gov, go to World Health Organization, go to the CDC. Those are the, the three places that I encourage you to look at. Thanks, Colette, for those questions. Number six, can we find a collective list of these COVID-19 codes somewhere asked Catherine. Now, again, this was off of that uh, little table that I made that I actually got from CMS that said, if you have, you know, pneumonia and COVID-19, this is the code you use, da, 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 da. Uh, ultimately, it was the B97 code, but now we have the U07 code, et cetera, et cetera. So actually, all you need to know is everything stays the same. The only thing that is different is that we do have the U07.1 code. And that means it is, it is implemented just like any other virus code. As far as we know, at this point, tomorrow, I'm sure the information will drop and everybody will be scrambling on uh, the guidelines or any stipulations or rulings, protocols, whatever they, they put in. It will get some guidelines. And then you know they'll pump a coding clinic or two out for us to, to give us some additional information. We don't really know quite what to ask until the scenarios happen when we have the code itself. So, uh, But this is where you would go. You can go to cms.gov put your site colon um, COVID-19. And this is where I got that toolkit that I just showed you. But everything that you need to know is going to be there. Yeah. The uh, AHIMA has some really, really good stuff pumped out too. So you might check in with AHIMA. Uh, I've been kind of following along with them. And let's see. Uh, Question seven. This is our last question. So let me just check and see how we're doing on time because you know me, I can get to talking and go off on a tangent. Hey, we're doing great. We're doing great for time. Do we code newborns with coronavirus differently? Ask Whitney. Whitney's here today. Uh, the fact is, no. Everything's going to be the same. Again, it would be just consider how would you code uh, with a newborn that has been exposed to the HIV virus? That if the, pay, if the mother has HIV and um, delivers, how would that be coded? If the um, mother uh, has COVID-19 and delivers, it's going to code just the same way. Now, I have, as of today, not heard any scenarios or examples of mothers that have COVID that deliver? Uh, I hope it never happens. And we don't know if the baby's born with COVID virus. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, you know, if it, it passes the barrier, I, uh, you know, I haven't seen anything. If you guys have done, heard anything, make sure you go to the club, let us know. Uh, but, as of now, I would do it just like you would any other type of communicable disease, uh, something that is contagious. Think of tuberculosis. What would you do? How would you code that, right? Uh, so other codes that I thought you might want to be aware of that you 
maybe haven't thought of because they're not codes that get used a lot is R68.13, a parent life threatening event in infant. This is kind of a gray area. Uh, it's if it a life threatening event happens, uh, then there, you, we have to statistically capture it. That's what we're doing while we're what we're doing. So it says confirm diagnosis if known. So then you could use the COVID uh, both. Uh, use any additional signs and symptoms if you don't have a, 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 a the code. So if we don't know it's COVID, but they have signs and symptoms, but this to me a pandemic. Uh, where the mother's been exposed or the mother has uh, has it, I would think that this might be a code you want to consider. Uh, you know, I've, I've never used this code. So again, bring it up, go to your compliance group, do your huddle and say, is, is this an option for us if we're, you know, OBGYN, you know, we're having babies and, and see see what they say. Now, another code that is uh, exposure to a communicable disease is the T75.89. Um, and the A is for initial encounter. You go to exposure and then you go down to two and then it goes to com like communicable uh, and then uh, it tells you to use this code. So, you know, these might be other options that are available to you. Uh, coding is not black and white, and it is very apparent now with a pandemic, with a uh, virus that we that that's brand new, and it's not the last time this is going to happen. And what my concern is is it, on a personal level, my th musing and uh, fussing in my brain is that now that we've experienced this. Hopefully it won't be something that is going to give us another pandemic because somebody purposely passes something out, right? Uh, uh, this is this is a learning experience for us and hopefully we'll never ever experience it again in our lifetimes. Uh, but, you know, none of us have lived through a pandemic before. So, uh, you know, we we're struggling to catch up. Just know like I always say this, you guys, and this is this this is so uh, perfect right now too, that we code for statistics, right? We code for the World Health Organization. We code for the CDC. This is why we do what we do. And a perfect example: a virus that was a uh, epidemic that turns into a pandemic. You know, we're able to trace all of these statistics and capture them. That's why they fast track to code so that we can relate that, okay, this patient is confirmed with COVID. We can link that to people that have asthma, that have rheumatoid arthritis, that have uh, diabetes. Uh, you know, now we know males, uh, the statistic came through that, that men were succumbing at a higher rate than women. How do we know that? because of the statistics that we capture. You guys play a part in that. So, you know, you don't just help the providers get paid. No, we're an uh, integral part of the way medicine works. Uh, policies and procedures uh, are based on these codes that we capture uh, from our provider's documentation. And uh, so we can wrap it up with, uh, so why is this virus so fatal? All flu flus are very, very, can be very fatal to people that are young, extreme ages, old and young, or have comorbidities or weaken immune system. Um, the reason, in my humble uh, opinion, is that uh, because this one's so new, and we don't know anything about it. Now we know it's a SARS, thus it comes from the SARS COVID two, but it's not acting like SARS. It's got a two to 14 day incubation period. When people got SARS and, you know, lived through it, it didn't come back. And, uh, you know, they weren't spreading the signs and symptoms. It, and, it, and maybe COVID-19 is, they're thinking that maybe it does. And so how are we going to know 
because of the statistics that we're going to be able to capture with this new code. Uh, you know, uh, it's also airborne. Airborne is a um, it is a lot harder to contain, and uh, another reason why they're taking such extreme measures to quarantine people. And the way that we will get through it is we will take the curve of everybody being exposed down to where there's less exposure. Once you get less exposure, that's how they got rid of SARS. That's how they got rid of MERS is less exposure, less exposure, less exposure until they've contained it to an area and other people aren't being exposed. But this is a rampant exposure that they've never seen before. That's a pandemic. So and fatal. You know, uh, and we don't know, uh, you know, I I don't know about food. I don't know how long it stays on things. Um, I would say go to the CDC because what they pushed out originally, that's been tweaked as more information comes out. So I could say what I read yesterday and that could be something that changes tomorrow as more information comes in. So again, so what do you do? You wash your food. You, you you take all the standard precautions that that everybody is doing and you go to reliable sources well guys this was a lot of fun it was a little bit different than we usually do our club webinars i know uh that uh you uh, uh are, we're adjusting and morphing as we go, but these questions have all come in and we don't want to bombard you and overwhelm you with COVID-19, but that was what all the questions were that came in. And that's what the club's for. These club webinars are to answer your questions. So uh, again, don't forget, go into the club, ask questions, let us know what you need help with. Uh, we're still here to answer questions that are not COVID. 19 related but um if you keep asking we'll keep doing the research and uh do the best that we can to stay on top of it amy says uh, are you going to be talking about cpt codes and insurance um, companies it has become a mission because insurance companies has different guidelines from the CPT. That is that is true. Do you have information on what the CPT codes are to use for commercial insurances? Okay, Amy, I do not have that at my fingertips, but Jennifer does. And she also just did last Thursday a webinar, and I know it's in the club, and I'm not sure how much of it uh, stayed up on the live stream, but she did talk about the commercial insurances. Uh, we talked, her and I talked about it today because we were discussing what uh, she was going to talk about on Thursdays. She is the billing aspect. That's the way her brain is. That's her experience. Um, and she is much more of a uh, CPT expert than I am uh, because I love ICD. So uh, what I would say is uh, Go back and reference the webinar from last Thursday. She addressed that as well as telehealth and Medicare. Uh, uh, it's in there. And if you would like uh, some type of maybe a cheat sheet or a fact sheet or something, uh, put a request in to the, the club and we can start working on that and, and do that for you. Let us know what you are looking for, what you need, and we'll do our best to, to compile that. We have some resources that maybe with subject matter experts that not everybody has access to. Um, I work in risk adjustment as well, and we're doing uh, a lot of interesting things on, hey, it does, uh, telehealth doesn't risk adjust, but with all these waivers and everything, we need to capture these chronic conditions. Uh, you know, what do we need to do? So. Our group is choosing, I think, uh, we'll know more in the next couple of days, to go ahead and separately use those to capture. And that way, if we get to use them, we can. If we don't, we've, we've done the work and it's there. So again, risk adjustment is a whole new uh, aspect of that. Uh, let's see, new rules out yesterday to use e &M codes, Melody says. So um, yeah, the Amy, again, reach out to the CCO club and and ask those questions uh, and we'll definitely do what we can. Let us know what you need and we'll move forward uh, and, and help you the best way we can. 
if we can't come up with definitive answers, we'll definitely give you the resources, suggestions, so that you can develop something within your group, you know, but um, we rely on you to let us know what you need. And um, otherwise, I'll just talk about risk adjustment all day long. <laughs> Ah, you know me. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And again, that's cco.us forward slash club. Uh, don't forget, you know, you know, you can catch us on Medical Coding Cert on YouTube. Uh, Facebook is cco.us and LinkedIn as well. Um, go find me on LinkedIn. Find cco.us on LinkedIn. And uh, we're uh, I share that stuff and some really great articles came through that I found that I posted uh, as well. And I know CCO is too. So we'll just network together and, and work with the facts that we're giving. And you know what? Tomorrow they'll change it all. But coders are adaptable. If you weren't adaptable, you wouldn't be in this career, right? <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us.